Welcome to the Edinburgh Talks Climate Podcast. Uh, I'm David Porteous, and joining me today to talk about biodiversity are Susan Faulkner, a, a biodiversity officer from the City of Edinburgh Council, and Ben Murphy, who's a postgraduate researcher in human geography at Edinburgh University. Welcome. Hello. Hello. I suppose, just to start us off with, since this podcast episode is going to be about biodiversity, what do we mean by biodiversity? That's a... a really fundamental question I think and one that is quite easy to answer I think from my point of view biodiversity officers in my job title so a lot of people do ask me well Susan what do you do what does a biodiversity officer do so I usually just take them back to well what is biodiversity and I would just say it's the variety of life that we have on earth the I think one of the other things that I want to sort of get across to people when I'm chatting to them about biodiversity is that we're part of nature. We're not apart from nature. We're we're part of nature. So that things that we do have an impact. And I often try and get people to engage with that and try and get a bit of a conversation with them about, well, what can you do for nature that's a positive thing? Or are you doing things that are impacting on nature that might not necessarily always be a good thing. We use up resources, um, we have an impact on uh, on the environment and on, on what we do. I think most people have heard about climate change and uh, are pretty concerned about, about that. So there's lots of opportunities, I think, to engage with um, colleagues and friends and family about biodiversity and about climate change and, and ecosystems and all these terms that are um, are banded around a lot. So when we say life, we mean what? Plants, animals? Animals, fungi, uh, everything from things that you might not like that are, are parasites, for example, or viruses, bacteria, um, and and other things like elephants and you know, plants and all sorts of other stuff. So, yeah, it, it's the variety. And I think that's that's one of the things that, I quite enjoy about being a biodiversity officer is that I'm challenged by the variety, the variety of things that I've got to do, the variety of people that I engage with. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, biodiversity di- and the, wor- the word the diversity of life, that that also, I think, kind of comes into it, that it's it, it's it's everything. It might be things that we, as I say, things that we we benefit from as a as a as a species and things that are, are maybe challenging for us um you know there's outbreaks of viruses at the moment that uh, that we're concerned about so you know i think we've got a lot of challenges lots of opportunities as well um perhaps using technology that's one of the other things that i think has come to the fore um but yeah i think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunity there as well as kind of threats if you like uh, and conflict, so it's always something that's pretty challenging. So some of the things that we hear about in relation to uh, climate change is that challenge to biodiversity. It's uh, We hear the word extinction um, a lot, but certainly a lot of species are more threatened than they uh, were before. I suppose the question for anyone thinking about why should I be motivated to do anything in relation to biodiversity, um, the question would be, what sort of consequences would we see of environments becoming less biodiverse? What does a less biodiverse Scotland look like? Yeah, I think um, it's a really important question and I think kind of relating to what biodiversity is, I think it's about appreciating that everything's kind of interconnected in in the natural world, Mm. but also that we are a fundamental part of that. Um, And I think biodiversity kind of comes down to this relationship between people, animals, plants, soils even, all of these things, insects, you know, the each kind of part has a really important role to play in, in kind of everything kind of being self-sustaining um, and, and kind of supporting life for us and for the animals. And I think what are the consequences? I think there's obviously this impact on, on kind of nature and the animals uh, and the, the plants and the trees. Um, but I think as well it's, it's kind of, nature and biodiversity is an inherent part of being a human i think is it kind of has a real significance that 
we can to help maintain it and and help it to thrive um and i think you know so, some of my kind of fondest childhood memories involve you know being out outside in nature um having some sort of connection or relationship with wildlife um and biodiversity more generally and i think it's it's um super important um and then you kind of obviously have the other sort of physical and and mental health benefits that that being around and within um, biodiversity more generally in that it kind of offers because because it is so important for us and ben, i'm, I'm going to get the term wrong mm -hmm. but are you into is it wild running i have got yeah. the term wrong i'm it looking just, at you just you running just, running, just running, running in generally in general um but i always i um i'm kind of from rural scotland and i really enjoy kind of running i guess in nature if you like in trees and kind of quiet places edinburgh's great because it's got loads of really nice green spaces um you kind of think about hollywood park um braids hermitage craig miller all these places that are that are brilliant and i think it's always really nice when you're out and you kind of the, you hear the bird song or you see you see some animals um i think that's just a really kind of nice experience to have and it doesn't have to be running it can be walking the dog or out with out with the family or kids or friends um and I think yeah, it's 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 one of those things that you kind of sometimes you don't always notice it, but I think you definitely notice it when it's not there, um, and when it's kind of um, becoming less. I think. So, so yeah. how does Edinburgh then stack up? I suppose against rural Scotland as a, yeah. as a comparison, because I think one of the uh, requests that's often made of mm -hmm. uh, local government is that our parks should be well maintained they should be yeah. very well mowed um they should look like lawns essentially yeah. just uh, expanses of lawns and one of the terms that's used around that in a sometimes negative context is a green desert something which looks vibrant and alive but isn't necessarily biodiverse so how do how do cities square up against the rest of the natural environment in terms of biodiversity so I think um, the key part of biodiversity is diversity, and I think with with green spaces, it's about having a mixture of of environments. I think, you know, I do, I do agree that lawns and kind of plain grass aren't great for biodiversity, but they're brilliant for letting kids play and kind of letting people interact socially. You know, do kids count in biodiversity? Do the number I think, of children, I think so. sizes yeah. of children. I think, they... I think, yeah, and you know, people walking their dogs and these sorts of things, just general play. You know, people sitting having their lunch when we get some decent weather. I think all of these things are really important, um, but I think there kind of needs to be a bit of balance with that, in having kind of more trees, more plants, some kind of wildflowers as well. I think it's about having the kind of the mixture of these two. Um, environments and then if you kind of can bring in the, the the plants and the trees then you'll kind of start to attract the birds and the bees <laughs> um, and kind of the, the squirrels you know um, rabbits all of these sorts of sort of smaller animals that maybe we take for granted um, it can make such a huge difference to someone um, one of the things that we find from uh, years of talking to people about their experience of um, Edinburgh parks is that seeing any sort of wild animal in a park context is in a sense uplifting it mm -hmm. does connect people more um to nature so it might not seem like it's not the same thing as a deer no obviously yes. like a squirrel yeah. but uh the impact that it has on someone is can be quite profound absolutely I suppose, is what I'd say. yeah and i think as well the the great thing about green spaces is it, it's a communal thing i think i don't know in some places it, it feels like everyone is kind of quite individual and, and kind of keeps to their own area, if you like. But I think with green spaces, it's great when you see big groups of people kind of all socialising together or, or doing a shared activity, whether that's sport, whether it's just kind of walking to work or cycling or running. And I think that's kind of really important. And, and the animals, I think, kind of feed into that and it, it kind of reinforces the idea that there is this kind of wider ecosystem and and bigger world than kind of just your own that you're part of i guess i certainly agree with that i think um now there's so many more uh, groups that are sort of bonding together so friends groups um i i know that i work with a few friends groups um friends of cemeteries uh, <laughs> which sounds like a <laughs> kind of an odd thing but 
uh, groups of local people that have come together to really value um, cemeteries as, as green spaces. And uh, they can be absolutely fantastic for wildlife. A lot of them have areas that perhaps are a little bit overgrown and, you know, some of the headstones and things, if they've if they've fallen, the headstones themselves are, are are small ecosystems with the mosses and lichens that are, are growing on them. But there's lots of... Uh, it's not just about the, the big parks, although, although I think in Edinburgh we're, we're absolutely spoilt having uh, some of the parks that you've just mentioned um, right in the centre that you know the accessibility I think is really important to get to get people out there and to uh, and as you said to connect with nature whether it's seeing you know a blackbird or a robin some of the commoner species that you see uh, that that's a, it's a real connection for for people but yeah just getting out there and I think as well just to go back to your point David about the sort of green deserts I think it's important uh, to have these sort of balances so that you've got some places where people can feel that they can enjoy themselves that they can run around uh, that they can play sport but also to have other places within that park that are a little bit wilder so letting what you might call weeds letting them grow so letting dandelions grow What's wrong with dandelions? Absolutely brilliant for um, for bees and, and pollinators and insects. And uh, in terms of not having to like, to cut the grass within sort of an inch of its life all the time, the, the the folks that are doing that could be diverted onto onto other tasks that would be a bit more positive. And I think already parks and green spaces within the council have really embraced these ideas. So. Um, but that also means kind of changing the mindset of residents and local people that um, neatness doesn't necessarily have to be the overriding factor. Letting things go a little bit wild. They're not going to be um, areas that are, are... They're not just being neglected. They're being managed in a different way. And I think it's sort of changing people's ideas and perceptions about what a good green space is having that balance that it's good for people but also it's good for wildlife as well and I think making space and taking time looking at, at sort of smaller things looking at the insects looking at, at the things that we should be kind of b building on that's really important as well so using wildflowers and wildflowers can be you know just as nice to look at because you know people enjoy looking at them so so getting getting that across as well and also i think not using chemicals where possible you know letting things grow being a little bit untidy being a little bit more tolerant of things you know that's a good way forward as well i think i i think that's uh, something to encourage so <clears throat> within our own uh, lifetime we saw uh, the rise and the impact of Dutch elm disease um, on one particular tree species, mm. which resulted in uh, hundreds of thousands of trees across the whole UK having to be destroyed uh, deliberately or um, being destroyed as part of that uh, disease. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of, uh, by, if you like, improving biodiversity by ensuring that we're not reliant on one tree species or one plant species for most of our uh, green space in a city, does that protect us against those kinds of, um, I suppose that's almost an extinction level outbreak for... It's certainly um, a threat, isn't it? The threat of invasive species. I mean, 2020, it's the year of in, invasive, uh, in, the year of plant health rather, you know, and looking at invasive uh, species and being mindful of those. I think um, the the city has uh, this kind of million trees aspiration as well, so doing a lot more planting. And what are we at just now? I think we're at something like three quarters of a million trees already. Yeah. So we've still got a quarter of a million to go. Um, and obviously, people know that tree planting is important in terms of our kind of carbon footprint, carbon capture, etc. Uh, but also, trees are nice to look at. And your point, 
David, about uh, about Dutch elm disease. There are lots of other um, potential plant health uh, diseases on the horizon. So I think a lot of us know now about ash dieback. So I think it's ensuring that when we are planting, that we're future proofing as best we can the species that um, that are likely to be impacted in 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 sort of greatest amount by climate change. So I think having that awareness, having that knowledge uh, of the ecology of uh, of of plants and and how these trees are going to react to that, I think is is crucial. So I think ensuring that we have that kind of knowledge to sort of take us forward, I think is really important so that we're not just, you know, planting monocultures that if we do get uh, an, an outbreak of some sort of plant disease, that we're, we're, we're just kind of left with, with nothing. Although interestingly, what you say about Dutch elm disease, what we notice now, we still have some cases of Dutch elm disease, of course we do, but the way that t- trees have responded they're now the ones that have survived are now growing in a completely different way so we see elms that are not big tall trees but are sort of much smaller they're sort of suckered growth a different um a different look to them but they're still there they're still kind of hung on i suppose so edinburgh is obviously one of the cities which benefited from a huge amount of uh tree planting sort of uh late victorian era um and what we're seeing now is a lot of those trees are actually coming towards the end of, well, within the next sort of 50 years, they'll come to the end of their natural life. Um, part of the reason why, if you like, we're, we're doing that million tree planting thing is obviously to make sure that we maintain that for future generations um, as well. I don't suppose you have to know what our, what our plans are. I mean, what are the trees going to be like in Edinburgh 50 years from now? Are we going for the same species or are we doing a sort of more diverse planting you have no idea I, I'm, not, That's I'm fine. not sure <laughs> <laughs> you probably need to ask someone who uh, was in parks and green spaces and sure. they would have a, a much more detailed kind of view and you know information about what would be ap- appropriate but I would think that as foresters foresters are not usually thinking of what's going to happen in the next five or ten years they are thinking 50 or a hundred years, you know, they're they're going to be thinking about trees, planting things now that they're never going, they're not going to see, uh, grow up. So, you know, I think they're they're always looking to the future as foresters. That's that's kind of in in the nature of, of what they do. So, I would I'm I'm speculating, but I would think that they've they've probably pretty much thought about the species mix, what's going to be appropriate, given the models. Um, and predictions about climate change, what what might uh, what might do best? I think um, just kind of picking up on that, we we talked to, at the start about this kind of interconnection of of the ecosystem. I think even though trees, if they are kind of needing to be taken down, or if they are naturally just dying off, um, they're still amazing homes for mm. insects and wildlife when they do um, kind of fell when they're on on the ground. I think it, that's part of the the message is kind of recognizing this importance that everything kind of serves a purpose in the natural world and for each other it's all sort of totally interconnected um unlike I'd, I'd hope if trees do need to be taken down then they can be kind of put back in or kept into the into the ecosystem because they they do provide so much food and shelter for for insects and smaller smaller animals as well which kind of then supports the larger animals and on a, and also the soil um so i think yeah it's it's really important to just because something's kind of coming to the end of its life or at the end that it can still have really um big value and significance for for biodiversity i think so So, i mean we've we've talked a lot about the psychological benefits of uh living in a sort of more diverse environment um with regard to both plant and animal uh species so if we value biodiversity uh, in Edinburgh, then what is within our power to to affect there? If we're talking about individuals, anyone listening to this podcast, what sort of actions could they start to take to improve biodiversity um, in the area immediately around them? Um, so I'd say 
a, a kind of really good one is kind of getting involved in local volunteer groups. Um, there are a lot throughout Edinburgh. Um, I won't try and name them all, but that do lots of different work around some are more targeted at kind of specific animals or or specific areas and others that kind of look after wider ecosystems. But I'd say getting um, involved in community volunteer groups is, is a really significant thing you can do. And that's, again, that brings back sort of building a community and kind of a communal shared activity. Um, but I think if, if you're someone who, who has some a small area of land, so a lawn or a garden, um, I think it's about encouraging uh, sort of birds through through kind of a mixture of plants and shrubs. Um, also, insect hotels are a really great one. So if you kind of have old old um, stacks of wood, you can kind of line those up with some branches and leaves. Uh, and these are amazing little homes for insects. Well, let's let's think about this then in terms of the the lowest level of uh, interest, the lowest level of uh, resource, the lowest level of time mm-hmm. that someone actually has to invest in this. So I'm I'm an Edinburgh resident, and I have no open space. Um, I have no extra time, and I've not got any money that I can invest in this. But biodiversity is something that I care about deeply. What is it that I can do for plant, animal, insect species in my area? What are the simple actions that are accessible to me? I'd say talk about it. It's it's something that I think often gets forgotten about um, and I think it's really important just to kind of chat about it with friends or colleagues or family um, and maybe recognising, so say you have seen something or, or there's, there's a local issue that you kind of feel really strongly about. I think it's about kind of having that open communication with other people and that's going to build awareness so maybe yeah you can't physically or materially do something but kind of on a a larger um level you can you can engage people in it talk about it um maybe bring it up at your at your workplace to kind of see what they're doing to help um and i think yeah kind of open communication is a really good um way and also as well um emailing or or writing to your to your councillors or your MPs or MSPs I think is a really important way of putting pressure on so they know that actually yeah people do really value biodiversity and it, and if it kind of becomes more um, publicly communicated then I think it's it's something that we'll all kind of benefit from in the in the longer term. So even if you we've we've got no resource we've got no mm-hmm. action uh, sorry we've got no access to things ourselves being involved in that community conversation is a genuinely important part yeah. of what people can do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, Ben. I think a lot of uh, green spaces have those friends groups that I was talking about and they get involved in practical work. So even if you haven't got any you know, extra kind of resource to, to put into that, giving of, if you've not got a lot of time, even if it's just, just an hour every month, uh, if they're going out and you know doing some kind of practical work, then I think that 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 he- all helps the campaigning and sort of um, political side of things. Yeah, that's very much an individual's choice, but you know can can make a a huge difference if you if you care about something. Then I think you're likely to to spend time and and put resource into that yourself. If you've got a small uh, garden, even if you've just got a balcony, um, growing a few plants for for pollinators, the, the good thing is that quite a lot of herbs that you can use in cooking are great for pollinators. So things like sage and thyme, um, rosemary, those are those are plants that you can easily grow just on a uh, you know a balcony on a on a on a windowsill. If you've got a larger space, um, one of the things that we're working on um, with colleagues in planning is house order applications. So for example, putting up a small extension. So it's it's pretty much uh, sort of s- smaller uh, development. Um, we're working with them to produce a, a a leaflet which would go out with each planning application that comes in to to give people some ideas about what they could do for biodiversity in their garden. So it might mean not using any chemicals or pesticides, letting nature, uh, ladybirds and lacewings, for example, do the do the work for pest control for you. Um, not mowing your lawn. Uh, it's quite so often letting. Uh, dandelions and clovers and all those things that we perhaps consider to be weeds but are important pollinating um, 
important plants, that's quite difficult to say, important plants for pollinators, <laughs> uh, letting, them, letting them grow, uh, use, making your own compost if you can, uh, having a pond, putting out bird feeders. We we're just chatting earlier about the importance of connection with, with nature, putting out some, some nice bird feeders you know, just to be able to see birds close up is is absolutely great. Really, really good. The bird feeders, obviously, I think I think there's a lot of attention, particularly around the winter, mm. for uh, making sure that you have bird feeders out because of the shortages um, of food. Yeah. Is that something that's worthwhile doing at other times of the year as well? Yeah, I think so. And also putting out water, making sure that that um, birds have got somewhere to to drink and to and to bathe. Um, Personally, I, I put out um, a, you know less food uh, in the summertime, but there's still something there um, for birds that are around. But there's lots of advice out there as well as to, to what to put out. Um, at, at the moment, I put out a range of things. It's sort of sunflower hearts, niger seeds, um, some peanuts and uh, fruit. Put some apples out. So, yeah, I get quite a good range of of uh, birds coming to the garden and uh, well, we really enjoy that. Well, those are bar snacks that you're putting out there. Yeah. Those are excellent, yeah. <laughs> well, um, the birds seem to like them anyway. Yeah, you, you were, we were talking uh, earlier on when we were on the way here about a, a particularly brilliant phrase that I liked, which was a hedgehog highway. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And so consider let's let's say the circumstances of this particular person of me have changed. Mm -hmm. I've now got a shared garden oh. at the back of my uh, flat, got a bit more scope. What is a hedgehog highway and why should I be talking to my neighbours <laughs> about doing it? Well, I think most people will be aware of the fact that hedgehog numbers have declined massively. I remember when I was a child, which was quite a long time ago, um, that there would be hedgehogs coming into to my garden and I, I like think nothing of it. But uh, just in, in recent times, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe the last decade or so, hedgehog numbers have, have plummeted. And uh, one of the things that we can do, which is really simple, obviously you need to, to chat to your neighbours, but cutting a, a small hole in your in your fence if you're if you're you know next to a neighbour just to, to let uh, hedgehogs be able to sort of commute between between gardens so that they're not just maybe stuck in one particular spot one particular garden then to get to another garden to get to where else they might like to feed they would perhaps have to go out onto the road or you know be yeah just be under threat from other things so having a little uh, a, a little highway to be able to move between gardens it just it's about interconnectedness and making the small gardens that we have their individual kind of units but it's much more valuable if the habitat can be joined up um it, you know to have more habitat to have uh, habitat that's better that's better joined is is a great thing just to be able to to for for birds and animals uh, insects to move between these places so that's i think that's one of the things is to ensure that our green spaces are if possible are joined up which is why river like the water of leith river almond they're such valuable wildlife corridors not only for fish and birds that use this that use the rivers but i think these wildlife corridors you know they're so valuable in terms of our own gardens you know they're kind of they can be mini wildlife reserves mini nature reserves we can do so much just by you know a few things like if we if we've got the ability to make a small pond you know it doesn't need doesn't need to be big um, to have some of these plants that we've just been talking about. Uh, and, not, you know, it's the one I like, and I, I did this last year in my own garden, it was called No Mow May. So I didn't mow my lawn, didn't cut my grass in, in May at all and just, just, let it all, just let it all happen. And uh, I liked it so much that I carried it right on until <laughs> July and the grass had got, had got quite long. But I, I cut a few kind of paths into the into the grass and round the edge so it although it looked a bit wild it still looked cared for because the edges were like really neat and i had some some paths to go through it so it was it was great um 
lots of bumblebees um, were coming to visit the clover um, because I didn't use any chemicals in the garden either. So, yeah, these these dandelions and 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 clovers and uh, and other little wildflowers that were popping up, absolutely brilliant, really really good to see, and I really enjoyed just sitting back and not not getting the lawnmower out. So, yeah, it was a win win. <laughs> In terms of, I think, species that we are perhaps most sensitive to in the UK just now, n- bee numbers has got to be one of the, the big ones that people care about um, a lot. And <clears throat> there is the perspective, uh, perception, that uh, bee numbers have been declining fairly significantly over a number of years. I uh, remember when my granddad used to take us out for drives in the country this was mid 80s or something you'd go a couple of miles and then you'd need to scrape down the windscreen of the car for all of the insects that you actually had uh, on it otherwise you wouldn't be able to see um and that doesn't seem to happen uh, anymore that sort of um numbers of insects and i think we're we're sensitive to bees as a species but it seems like there's a totality of insect numbers which are down as well that's my perception of that is that the case i'd say so yeah there's um there's definitely been reports and kind of scientific findings recently kind of estimating the numbers and the percentages and it's 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 quite a kind of colossal issue um and i think coming back to the when you're saying about sort of things like bird food um some of these things sometimes are, are kind of financially dependent and i think just letting things kind of be if you like um, letting the grass grow, maybe maybe if you can invest in a couple of uh, wildflower seed packets, which are only a few pound, um, and kind of scattering these in your garden. Like if you kind of leave these, um, it's amazing what kind of nature would sort of do to itself and the and the kind of natural regeneration that can happen, which is like amazing for insects and bees, but I think insects more widely because birds are so dependent on them for food the soil and um, the soil health other plants and sort of smaller shrubs are so so um dependent on on having sort of a thriving insect population which kind of then supports the larger life as well um but yeah i think it is a it is a big issue and you um things like pesticides and chemicals and stuff are also really detrimental to insect numbers um I think it's it's sort of one of them things that you don't you don't really think about because they they can be so small and seem so sort of insignificant on their own, but like as a kind of entire population, insects are are um, huge for for biodiversity and and life more generally. Yeah. So is there an argument to be made that if what we're doing is we're allowing our domestic gardens to become wilder, that provides much more of a food source for birds in uh, and other animals uh, for the rest of the year so that that actually reduces the reliance, reduces, if you like, our need to provide those bird feeder sort of artificial uh, solutions that nature will take care of itself if we yeah. allow it the space to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's still... I'm not saying don't don't put bird food out. No, Win- no, no, winter, no we're not anti-birds. We're, we're just, winter's we're just really, saying... You know, winter's a really good time. Usually when it's really cold and the ground's frozen... They, the birds can't get at the insects, so it, it's great to put bird food out. But I think kind of looking at a longer term, sustainable sort of practice um, would be that. And like hedgehogs as well, um, really reliant on insects for food. Um, so yeah, I'd say it, it's something that would be great. And it doesn't have to be your whole lawn. It could be a ti- sort of one eighth of it, a tiny square in the back corner that maybe you wouldn't really use otherwise. Just Just let it grow, see what happens, you know. Leave it for a month, go back, have a look, see what's in there, and then and then maybe you can add some things that'll that'll kind of help the rest of your garden. But I think that's a really nice starting point. Mm. Um, and even like at the front of tenements, if you've got little patches of grass, um, or kind of more sort of wildflower areas, just just kind of let them let them grow. Obviously, if it's kind of encroaching on walkways and stuff, it might be it might be a good idea to kind of trim it back a little bit. But it doesn't need to be sort of totally eradicated um and that can be really nice you know we were saying earlier about how nice it is seeing wildlife and and birds and bees you know if you kind of walking out in the morning through the spring and summer then you're gonna attract these these um sort of insects and birds to to near your home and you don't necessarily need to go to a, a green space then to experience that um so yeah 
So. Yeah, I think people would be quite amazed as to what's on their doorstep. I mean, I work um, in the centre of Edinburgh and usually at lunchtime, you know, I've got maybe an hour and I'll go out and just have a, a bit of a walk and I go out onto Colton Hill or I go to Holyrood Park and the, the number of, of things that I see, just because I suppose uh, I, I'm interested and but I just take the time to look and uh, one of the, the species that I found out on uh, on Colton Hill is called the grayling butterfly. And numbers of grayling butterflies are are generally quite low. They, they like um, they like fairly open habitats, and they, they like grassland. They like they, they feed on on grasses, and uh, they're really well camouflaged. A sort of beautiful kind of grey and brown and uh, and white on them. They're absolutely fantastic. And when I go out uh, for a walk at lunchtime in the summer, um, I can go and watch these relatively scarce butterflies. You know, right in the centre of Edinburgh, um, some of the work that uh, Butterfly Conservation and um, City of Edinburgh Council that uh, manage um, Colton Hill, and they've done some clearance of, of gorse specifically for grayling butterflies, and it's, it, it really has started to pay off actually seeing more, um, more of them flying there. That's also, I think, incidentally, benefited uh, you're talking about bees david so solitary bees solitary bees uh, are often um <laughs> on their own the name would suggest that they don't they don't um they don't make big colonies like like honeybees or uh, even bumblebees have colonies of maybe 50 to 100 individuals but solitary bees are you know maybe just ones and twos and they have uh, an aggregation there's, there's usually a few uh, females that will uh, make nests uh, in the ground, they'll they'll, um, they'll excavate out little tiny um, sort of burrows, little holes. These little mining bees, and uh, clearing the gorse has made uh, sort of these open areas much more accessible to solitary bees. So um, last year, when I went out on my sort of lunchtime walks, I'd be seeing these fantastic little solitary bees buzzing in and out. Often, the solitary bees have their own um, parasites their own parasitoids that that will be looking to lay their eggs in the solitary bees' nests. So I've seen the solitary bees, the parasites, and there's also this there's a fantastic wasp that will parasitize on some of these solitary bees. And it's called the ruby-tailed wasp. And it's amazing. It, it looks like a flying jewel. It's uh, it's sort of got a, a it's got a ruby tail as the, the name would suggest and and kind of beautiful other colours on it too. So you don't need to go very far to see something that is has got an absolutely, inc- it looks incredible and it's got an amazing lifestyle as well. So, you know, within 10 minutes of my office, all that's there on the doorstep for people to, to look at and to and to appreciate. It's, it's, it's incredible, you know, just if you take the time to, to go and look and, and to, to learn about some of these things. Absolutely brilliant just to, to see that. You've got yeah. as well now, um, there's quite a sort of small but thriving population of otters on the, the yeah, water relief as well, um, which is incredible. Like, I, I don't know, I think otters are one of our kind of most amazing mammals. Um, and they, they they kind of re, rebuilt the, the water relief so it's supported eels, I think, um, which is what otter, otters feed on and kind of supporting the eels through kind of smaller, smaller, um, uh, water-based insects um, and algae and food and stuff um, and you've now got yeah these otters that kind of wander around the water leaf and, and kind of yeah. swim up and down it which is incredible, incredible in the middle of a city to yeah. have. There's been a lot um, on social media about mm-hmm. about that I think there was I saw something last week I think it was a BBC and there was um, a couple of otters and this was right in the centre it was at Fountain Bridge and uh, absolutely incredible but yeah there's lots of um there's just such a, a lot of information and interest in these kind of iconic mammals you know probably no one's ever heard of a ruby-tailed wasp but i was quite excited about it but probably everybody else has he- heard about otters and you know um there's a good few kind of parks and as you say the water of leith the union canal and uh, it, it gets people out interested and in looking 
And, you know, just being able to enjoy nature on the doorstep, I think is, you know, that's a fantastic thing. People talk about um, you you won't um, care about something that you don't know about, that you, that you can't connect with. It doesn't matter if you know its name. You don't, you don't have to know that that's a ruby-tailed wasp. But if you're excited about that and you think, oh, wow, look at that, what is it? If you get excited about something like that, you're going to... I think it's just going to make you care more about it and want to do something about it and tell your friends, bore your family <laughs> with going on about otters and kingfishers and all all that sort of thing. I know that as a a biodiversity officer, I'm I'm probably viewed as a bit crackers, but um, people will they they know that I'm interested in wildlife and they will they will come to me with with um, pictures of strange things and go. Susan, can you tell me what what this is? It's you know, a blurry picture or something. But at least they're interested. At least they they want to know what that is. They want to know how it how it lives, where you know where it where it connects. Um, so that and that's really how good. How often are you are you fulfilling the role of a sort of doctor here, Susan? How, <laughs> how often are people going? What is this thing which has stung me, quite, Susan? <laughs> quite often, quite often. Yeah, particularly in the summer. Um, yeah, but people see things in their garden and they go, oh, well, I've not seen that before. Can you tell me what it is? And I, I do my best. Often it's it, you know, it's not a great picture or if it's an insect, sometimes it's just too difficult, you know, to say exactly what it is. But um, usually, I mean, there's a, such a lot of information online and we've got our own Twitter account as well with uh, in the in the Edinburgh Biodiversity account. And uh, we can usually point people to to someone who could, to could who could help, who would be uh, you know an ex an expert on some of it. But but just people being enthusiastic about it, I think they they probably just want to shut me up and <laughs> don't just send her a picture of something. But a lot of people will send us uh, information and pictures about the about the about the otters it's just been fantastic the amount of interest that that has generated and also if people have seen anything else like foxes or badgers um you know they'll report that i think it's important to have uh, to keep records of things keep, to keep records of wildlife so that we know where things are and we're able to measure um you you're talking about insects earlier david and uh I think it's important to be able to measure uh, success. It's important to be able to measure where perhaps we could do better. So, you know, how do we know that we need to do something about insect numbers unless we've got some some metrics, unless we've got some way of measuring that? Do we know that these grayling butterflies have declined? We won't know that unless we measure that in some meaningful way. So ensuring that people are interested enough to uh, submit records about the otters, how many they've seen, where they've seen them. You know, that just build, helps to build up a picture of how biodiversity is doing throughout Edinburgh. And I guess we've got some keystone species that are really good indicators of the kind of overall ecosystem health, if you like. So butterflies are a really good one. Um, and they're relatively easy to measure. You don't really need to be a specialist to know what a grayling butterfly or a um, peacock butterfly looks like. You can just, you can see that in your garden and you can enjoy that. Some species, I think, need to be, you know, you need to you need to be a bit of an expert. But there's there's room for lots of citizen science and that's certainly something that is a great way of engaging people you know, going out and looking for ladybirds. And, you know, there's lots of surveys that are, are kind of online citizen science projects which can be really meaningful. And people people's uh, records do make such a difference. So that's one of the things that I always encourage people to do. Um, and there's, there's so many great apps. There's one called iRecord, which um, is such an easy one to use. Um, even if you don't know what something is, um, you know, you can ask your biodiversity officer or ask somebody uh, who might know. But, you know, in terms of Twitter, for example, as an online kind of Twitter community about helping people to identify things, it's great. There's a lot of support out there, you know, for people that want to do that. It's really good. 
one of the things that we're hoping to do as part of these uh, conversations is actually involve more Edinburgh residents in uh, identifying positive behaviours that they can do themselves, things that are completely within their control, and we're doing that using uh, our dialogue uh, website, and we'll have some links somewhere associated with this podcast so people can uh, follow them and we'll include some links to some of those tracking apps that you were talking about Mm -hmm. uh, there as well. Um, I suppose when we think about um, sustainability, environmentalism in general, one of the things that we are often uh, told to do is consider our own buying behaviour in relation to uh, the changes that we want to see in the world. So fair trade has certainly uh, become uh, a thing Uh, organic produce labelling has become a thing uh, over a number of years. I suppose, are there particular buying behaviours? Are there habits that one should be adopting specifically with regard to biodiversity that would um, help uh, native species, basically? Uh, Yeah, I think organic definitely is is important um, because as we were talking about the importance of soil health, and kind of the wider biodiversity that supports. Um, so I think organic is definitely something that, that can be... Look, I do fully appreciate organic can be quite a bit more expensive, so it's not always feasible for everyone. Um, but I think if you can if you can maybe spend a little bit extra, you you, you are obviously contributing to, to supporting wildlife. It tastes a lot better, um, and you're kind of... You're enjoying it a bit more as well. Um, but I think looking for for particular labels that are that are maybe products that are more sensitive to to where things are made or grown is also really important as well. Yeah, I think where possible, trying to buy things that are produced lo- um, food that's produced locally, not got lots of air miles. You know, I'm sure folk are are quite uh, kind of in tune to reducing air miles. So that you don't expect to eat strawberries in the middle of winter or kiwi fruits that have been frozen, um, uh, uh, have been flown halfway around the world, just so that you can have them. I think maybe changing our expectations about what we can eat and what we should be eating. Um, uh, you know, that conversation needs needs to be had. But yeah, having things that are seasonal, eating seasonally good food and eating food that's uh, local i think there's there are uh, you know a lot of um local food growing uh, initiatives edible edinburgh for example um and also if you if you've got space to to grow something uh, in your own garden well yeah give that a go i mean i grow potatoes every year in just little potato bags and it's it's brilliant it's it, and you've just got that kind of, oh, I've grown something. It's, you know, a bit of an achievement and you can really enjoy what you've grown. You know, I, I made some, uh, I've not got a very big garden uh, and I made some raised beds out of uh, some scaffolding planks that I had. There was a house down the way that was getting done up and they didn't know what to do with the planks and I said oh I'll have those then if if you're getting rid of them so got the planks and um, I needed to have some soil obviously to get the raised bed started so I thought well I was thinking about digging a pond so I dug the pond and used the soil from the the pond um, when I was making the pond to start off the raised beds and uh, so that all worked out quite well Um, and I try and compost um, stuff. So some of the the grass clippings that I had saved up from not cutting the grass and not putting chemicals on it, absolutely ideal to to get the compost, get the compost going as well. So yeah, I enjoyed eating the potatoes that I'd grown in these little bags, uh, whatever it was. Car- I think carrots and leeks and onions are really easy stuff, um, and. Uh, uh, just leaving things at the end, just uh, you know, leaving the uh, some well, some of the leeks actually sprouted, and they produced flowers, and then I noticed there was a lot of hoverflies on the flowers, and I thought, all oh, right, well, I think I'll I won't yank them up, I'll just leave them, um, and some of the carrots had bolted as well, so there was there was carrot flowers, so yeah, it was a, a bit of a win for the 
a win for the insects as well. They were getting a bit of, from my um, learning about gardening, getting that all going. It was it was pretty simple stuff, you know. I think another thing as well is if you've got um, children at school, maybe seeing if the playground, if they have some grass area, if they can maybe convert that into a sort of small vegetable patch or like you were saying, getting some raised beds can be a really great way of, of getting kids outside a bit of mm. kind of outdoor education um, and they love it and then if you're if they're then going to be able to to harvest that and eat it that really builds a great connection with with um, plants and kind of that that type of produce sort of seasonal fruit and veg as yeah, well kind of um, value I think it's a really simple thing and local uh, and easily done um, mm. for for some schools to be able to do that would be great yeah okay um i'm probably going to wrap it up there if that's okay thanks to susan and ben for being involved in today's discussion about biodiversity if we've said anything that you thought was interesting and that you want to contribute to the discussion too um, please follow uh, one of the links through to uh, our dialogue discussion we'd really like to hear from all of you about uh, your suggestions for how people can improve biodiversity and some of the other issues in terms of sustainability uh, in edinburgh um, thanks for listening